Uh, today I get to introduce to you guys uh, a pastor, pastor from our uh, PBA, uh, Pastor Mark Stoke. Uh, he is the assistant or the associate pastor at uh, the church at uh, St. Charles. Uh, 20 years ago, me and Darcy visited that church. Uh, and he's, uh, he's currently serving there. He's currently pursuing his uh, master's in divinity. Uh, and uh, says here he's single. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to read that. All right. Um, uh, but he is, uh, he's going to bring us the word today. And I'm excited, excited to hear him. And uh, we thank you. Well, good morning, church. It is a blessing to be here with you this morning, and we do bring, uh, uh, we just bring greetings to you from the Church of St. Charles. Pastor Fred, I think, was here. I don't know exactly when he was here. I think last week of May he was here, but he's uh, the senior pastor there and the head of PBA, and it is just so good to be with you this morning and uh, to see God move. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, we didn't really, I didn't really plan this, but seeing uh, the commissioning prayer and you guys going on mission uh, to East Cleveland this week and then to Cleveland, Ohio in a few weeks and then I think Mexico in a few weeks, it kind of fits right in. And so uh, this morning, I just want to bring the word to you. We're going to be in Mark chapter 5. Uh, Mark chapter 5, we're going to be in this morning. But before we get to Mark chapter 5, I just want to tell you a story first. And this story is a true story from God's word. Jesus had been teaching all day. And when night fell, his closest followers, he told his closest followers, let's get into the boat and let's go to the other side of the sea. Jesus and his closest followers got into the boat. And when they got into the boat and they were some distance offshore, all of a sudden the wind picked up. And the waves began crashing over the boat and the boat began to sink. As the boat was sinking, Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat. His closest followers came to Jesus and they said, don't you care that we're about to die? Jesus, getting up from his sleep, rebuked the wind, told the waves to be silent and the wind to be silent. When he did... There was no more winds and the waves became calm. Jesus turning to his closest followers, his disciples, he says, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? Not answering the question, his closest followers looked amongst themselves and they said, who is this man? that even the winds and the waves obey him. That is a true story from God's word. You'll find that story in Mark chapter four, verse 35. It happens right before this story that we're about to read in Mark chapter five, verses one through 20. And what I want you to focus on from that story is four questions. The disciples asked two questions and Jesus asked two questions. The first question The disciples asked, don't you care that we're about to die? The next two questions were from Jesus. The first one was, why are you afraid? The second one, do you still have no faith? And the last question by the disciples was this, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? We're going to see in this next story, when we, we're going to read Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 here in a second, we're going to see these four questions come into play. And I wanted those four questions to kind of lead us, right? Because Jesus is asking people that are supposed to be following him, his closest followers, his disciples, and they are following him. And his, and the, the, his closest followers, his disciples, are asking those two questions to Jesus, Don't you care that we're about to die? And who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? As we make our way through this passage in Mark chapter five, verses one through 20, I want you to focus on three things. The total depravity of humanity, the transformation of humanity, and and that we as Christians are tasked with God's mission for 
humanity. Let's read Mark chapter five, verses one through 20. I'll be reading from the CSB version. The word of God says this. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Gerasenes. And as soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. He lived in the tombs and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain. Because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he knelt down before him and he cried out with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name, Jesus asked him. My name is Legion, he answered, because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. Our large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. The men who tended them ran off and reported it in the town and the countryside, and people went to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting there, dressed, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs. Then they began to beg him to leave their region as he was getting into the boat, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus did not let him, but told him, go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And they were all amazed. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you for Southern Calvert. We thank you for this church. We thank you that you're working through them and going on mission and doing events here at the church. Lord, we praise your holy name for uh, the baptisms or the confessions of faith that happened this last week in VBS, Lord. Lord, we are so grateful that you give us the ability to come in this free nation. And Lord, for so many, that is not... Um, it's not free, Lord. And so, Lord, we thank you for those who are serving this nation. We thank you for those who have served this nation so we can come here in safety and with freedoms, come and proclaim your word and sing praises to you. Lord, may you, you may your word be proclaimed through me this morning. May your word initiate change of hearts, strengthening of hearts, and the moving out of your people into this world, Lord. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. If you don't mind, we're gonna be flipping back and forth between Psalm chapter five and Mark chapter five. So if you wanna leave your uh, hand or finger in March or Psalm chapter five as well, I wanna start with the, the total depravity of man. And I wanna start there in Psalm chapter five. In Psalm chapter five, David is writing. And he says in the first three verses, he says this, listen to my words, Lord, consider my sighing, pay attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for I pray to you. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I plead my case to you and watch expectantly. So this is a prayer. This is, a, this is a petition of God, what we're about to read in the next few verses. We're, like I said, we're gonna flip back and forth. So we're not gonna read all the verses right now. But I wanna focus on verses four through six, and then we're gonna jump down through nine, nine and 10. Let's read four through six, and then we'll jump down. We'll skip seven and eight for now. We'll come back to it, but we wanna come back. We'll read nine and 10 as well. Four through six says this, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil cannot dwell with you. 
The boastful cannot stand in your sight. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who tell lies. The Lord abhors violent and treacherous people. Jumping down to verse nine, speaking of these same treacherous people. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Destruction is within them. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongues. Punish them, God. Let them fall by their own schemes. Drive them out because of their many crimes. For they rebel against you. David's very clear. It's not because they rebel against me. It's not because they rebel against the church. It's because they rebel against God himself. And, God, and David's pleading with the Lord, take care of them. So what happens to the evil, treacherous people? The Lord abhors evil. The Lord cannot be in the present. And for eternity, at one point, when the Lord takes us all, when we all bow before the Lord, we're all gonna bow, every person, every Christian and non-Christian is gonna bow before Jesus Christ. And some of us are gonna bow before Jesus Christ in reverential awe. Those are who are saved. And there are gonna be some who bow before Jesus in fear because they know their time has come to an end. So what happens in between? When we jump back to Mark 5, I want you to focus on a couple things here. We see three things about this man who's demon-possessed. Three things. He lived in the tombs amongst the dead people. He's alive, and yet he's dead. Exactly how I was before I came to salvation in the Lord. Before the Lord called me out, I was a dead man walking amongst, I, I was alive, sorry. I was alive, but I was walking amongst the dead because God had not called me out of the world yet. He's living in the tombs, but he's amongst the dead. Number two, no human endeavor could subdue him. He broke every human chain. He broke every human shackle. No human had the power to subdue this man. Number three, he was hurting himself by cutting himself with stones. He was physically hurting himself. We'll come back to that in a second. We also learn four things about the demons that were possessing this man. They knew Jesus was the son of the most high God. Think back to the, four, to the two questions that the disciples asked Jesus. The last question was what? Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? And these demons bow down before Jesus and they say, Jesus, son of the most high God. Even the demons knew who Jesus was. Number two, they knew Jesus had power over them for they begged Jesus not to torment them. Think about this for a second. The only people that can torment somebody are people that have power over somebody. That can be human to human. My prayer is that it's not. That can be God to Satan, but Satan can never torment God because God has ultimate power. Satan does not. So Satan right? These demons, they bowed down before God because they knew that Jesus Christ had power over them because Jesus has power over everything. All the demons over me, over you, over everybody in the world. They knew Jesus had power. We also learned that they were many. They call themselves a legion. A legion in the Roman army would have been an army or a regiment of about 6,000 in that day. Now, I can't sit here and tell you there were 6,000 demons possessing this man. I can't tell you that. All I can tell you is that they were many. There were many demons possessing this man. Number four, and this is going back to the man also cutting himself, but the demons wanted to destroy 
God's creation. Think about this. The demon-possessed man was doing what? Cutting himself, destroying the very flesh that God had given him. And when God releases them, the demons beg to go into the pigs. And Jesus gives them exactly what they want. And what do they do? They kill the pigs. They force the, the demon, when the demons come on, on the pigs, they run off the cliff and they're all dead. The demons want to kill God's creation. The demons wanted to destroy God's creation. I want to go back to the two questions that the disciples asked Jesus in the previous story. The first one was, don't you care that we are going to die? Man, when you read this next story, the demon-possessed man story, Jesus cares. I mean, I don't know about you, but if a, somebody that is broken every chain and shackle, somebody who is constantly screaming in the graveyard, if all of a sudden they walked in here, right? And they walked right here, right? And now hopefully they don't bow before me because I'm not God. But all of a sudden they walk right, I, I, I hope, I, I met some people on security team this morning. I hope security jumps up. I'm gonna be honest with you because I have no idea how I would react, right? Jesus had compassion on that man. He asked him what his name was. Jesus had compassion. Don't you care that we're going to die? Yes, Jesus cares. In fact, he cares so much that he went to the cross for you. And he cares so much that he wants to drag you out of your own death, the second death. And he's calling each of us to himself. The second question, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? We already talked about that, but the demons knew the answer to that question as well. So now we see the transformation of humanity, the total depravity of humanity. This man had, this man had no, no recourse on his own. He was just going to die. He was just going to live the rest of his life amongst dead people and then he was just going to die. Really had no hope. He was an outcast in society. Nobody wanted him. But God did. Jesus did. Jesus wanted this man. And so now we see the full transformation of humanity. At the ordering of Jesus, the demons leave the man and went into the pigs and they destroyed the pigs in verses 12 and 13. Verse 15 tells us that the man who was possessed is now sitting. He's dressed, which I guess is a big thing. I don't know. I don't know if he was naked or not. I don't know when he was amongst the dead people. I don't know. But he was dressed and he was in his right mind. We sang a song, I had to write some notes. We sang a song, I don't know, remember which song it was, but the song said, who rescued me from the grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. We also sang in, in, that, in that same song said, who saved us from the pit? He did, he did, King Jesus. A full transformation. From screaming amongst the dead people while alive, to sitting dressed in his right mind, a full transformation. The same transformation I underwent when I came to the Lord between my freshman and sophomore year in high school. The same transformation that I went through that saved me from eternal damnation. Because I was lost. I had grown up in the church I was telling Brother Mo this morning, uh, 
the church that I attend right now is a church I grew up in. I've been there since 2001. I was in the fifth grade when I arrived there. Pastor Fred is the only pastor I've ever really known. And it was just a seamless transition to come on staff there and to work towards the MDiv. But even though I had been there, even though I had been in a gospel preaching church, it wasn't until a child during VBS. And for those who are going on mission, listen to this. I was on mission as a youth. We were doing VBS at a campground. And on Wednesday, I think they changed it to Thursday now. But back then on Wednesday, every Wednesday was the ABCs of Christ. Admit, believe, confess. And I had a child come up to me as I was helping with the crafts. And these big fingers shouldn't be doing crafts anyway. So I was glad to have a distraction, okay? All right. The little child came up to me and said, what did it feel like when you came to the Lord? And I couldn't answer the question. I'd grown up in the church My parents brought me to church faithfully. We were even doing Wednesday night dinners. My dad's a chef, so we naturally began cooking dinners every Wednesday night for Wednesday night Bible study. I was at the church more than almost anybody else except for the pastor. And yet when that child asked me, what did it feel like when you came to the Lord? I couldn't answer him. And so that afternoon, I went down to the lake, the river, whatever you want to call it, body of water, and I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior right there. And at that moment, the full transformation of the heart came into being. I had not made Jesus my own. Jesus was my mom's Jesus. Jesus was my dad's Jesus. Jesus was my grandfather's Jesus. My grandfather preached in Holland for many years. But Jesus was not my own. A full transformation had to take place still. On the outside, I was all good. I was going to church. I was doing everything I needed to do. But in reality, I was simply alive and walking amongst the dead. If you turn back to Psalm chapter 5, I want to read 7 and 8. We've seen what David says about the treacherous people, the wickedness. And now we see in verses seven and eight, he speaks about himself. In verse seven, he says this, I enter your house by the abundance of your faithful love. I bow down towards your holy temple in reverential awe of you. Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my adversaries. Make your way straight before me. The transformation comes because of the power of Jesus Christ and his abundance of faithful love for us. When the end comes... Will you bow down in reverential awe before Jesus? Or will you bow down before him in fear because you know that the time is up? Today is the day of salvation. Jesus is patient. The Lord is patient with us because he does not want one to perish. Are we entering his house of abund- by the abundance of his faithful love towards us? When we come together as a church, we are the church, but when we come together as a church, do you come in here with love for each other and love for God? And my prayer is that it's yes. And if it's not, that you find the true meaning of who Jesus is this morning. So now the transformation is complete. Jesus has proven his power over the demons, Jesus has proven his power in salvation. Jesus has proven himself. And now Jesus tasks us with a mission. What a grateful God, gracious God. I mean, because I am not worthy of any mission 
given by God. I am the most wicked of sinners. But this man who was once demon possessed and had enmity with God has had a full transformation. And now the people are afraid. The people that knew him best before his transformation are begging for Jesus to leave the area. The people who knew him best were not happy for this man or even joyful for this man. In fact, it almost seems like they're more worried about their pigs than they are about the transformation of this man. The people that knew him best could care less about the transformation that Jesus has shown them. And you know, working with Muslims on a regular basis This is the greatest fear of most Muslims coming to Christianity because they're going to be cut off from their whole family. But let me ask you, why are you afraid? And where is your faith? The two questions Jesus asked. Jesus goes to go back into the boat and Jesus tells him, this man wanted to go with Jesus I mean, think about this for a second. I I was going to talk about this next week, but think about this for a second. How easy would our lives have been that at the transformation that Jesus just took us to heaven? (laughs) My goodness. I mean, it would be wonderful to be honest with you. That's our great hope, right? (laughs) I mean, our great hope is that we're going to be in heaven with Jesus. That's our great hope. Our great hope is that Jesus is coming for us again. It would be so easy. Life would be so easy. My mom would never have had to go through two cancer battles. I wouldn't have had to watch loved ones die. I wouldn't have had to watch all the things that have happened in this world. But that's not what God called us to do. God tells this man, you can't come with me yet. Rather, what does he have to do? Go to your people and tell them how gracious I was to you. And the mercy that I showed you. That's our mission. We're going to talk about more of that next week when I, hopefully, you'll have me back next week. But for today, I want to read the end of Psalm chapter 5 and then give a couple closing comments. David, David has gone through a range of emotions. He's called out those evil people that are harming him, that are doing evil against him, doing evil against God. He's talked about himself and how he enters into uh, the house of the Lord by the abundance of the faithful love, how he bows down in reverential awe. He ta- he's talked about uh, the, 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 those without God, those 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 sinful people, there's nothing reliable in what they say. Destruction is within them. But then look at verse 11. But let all who take refuge in you, Lord, those who take refuge in you, rejoice. Let them shout for joy forever. May you shelter them and may those who love your name boast about you. For you, Lord, bless the righteous one. You surround him with favor like a shield. Who are you boasting in this morning? My prayer is that it's not in yourself. My prayer is that it's not in a pastor. My prayer is that it's not in a mom or a dad. My prayer is that you are able to boast in the Lord because you have a personal relationship with the Lord to this morning and that you are been commissioned for God's mission for humanity. We know the Lord will shelter us. Are we shouting for joy this morning? Are we rejoicing in the Lord this morning? My prayer is that it's yes. Are we boasting in the name of Jesus Christ this morning? My prayer is yes.
Jesus told the man to report to the lost people in the Decapolis, which is a string of 10 cities, 10 Gentile cities. We'll get into that next week, but 10 Gentile cities. And he told them to report to them how much the Lord has done for him and how Jesus had mercy on him. David in Psalm 5 said to those who love the Lord should boast about the Lord. We have the same command today. Mark 16, 15 says this, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Don't get hung up on that word preach. That word preach is simply just to teach. It is not the office of pastor. It is not the office of uh, the pastor or an elder or whoever. It is simply to teach the gospel to all creation. Matthew 28 tells us this, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them all the things I have taught you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We don't go in our own power. The first part, which we sometimes leave out in the American church is all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. And that's Jesus Christ, not me. Jesus Christ says that. So we go in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ as we leave these doors and we go out into the world, wherever you go, I don't know, work, school, well, school's out, I guess. I don't know, maybe summer school, right? When you, wherever you go during the week, we go in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And we go and we make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we teach them all that, we, that he has taught us. How much has Jesus taught you? I'm amazed that I can, and this is not me, hopefully you don't think this is me patting myself on the back. I'm amazed that I can just think of verses on the fly sometimes. From where I started to where I am now, that is not because of me, okay? That is all because of Jesus Christ. I'm amazed sometimes when verses come to me and that I remember. That's Jesus Christ working in me at that time for a certain purpose to go and make disciples of all nations. So I ask you the same two questions again that Jesus asked his disciples on the boat. Why are you afraid? Well, we'll ask a different question. Are you afraid? If you are afraid, why are you afraid? And if you are afraid, find somebody that's not afraid and go with them, do life with them. And do you still have no faith? Where is your faith this morning? Is it in the name of Jesus Christ? We will take a closer look at this mission as we come back next week. There's much to say about God's mission. There are verses aplenty about God's mission. We will look at that next week. But what I want to end with is actually something that I found on your website and was on the front of your bulletin this morning, I think. Yes. I don't know if you call it a motto or I don't know exactly what you guys call it here, but it says connecting people with Christ and Christ's people with one another. That's what you guys have on the front of your bulletin. My question for you, and I'm not your pastor, so don't think, but which one of those are you taking part in? Connecting people with Christ means the Great Commission. And connecting Christ's people with one another is what we do as an internal mission within the church. It's called discipleship. Which part do you have a part in this morning? My prayer is that you have a part in both in some way, but God has gifted each of us in a certain way. Some he's gifted for discipleship and some he's gifted for evangelism, missions. But they both work so well together. Because those who are on mission, those who are evangelizing, need the support of those that are sitting around them this morning. Need the support of connect groups. Need the support of different areas in this church. 
Because I'll tell you, having spent three and a half weeks in a foreign country, very closed off, according to them, they hate Americans, they hate Christians. Having spent three and a half weeks there, it was a great blessing to be able to come home and be around people that love me. Because I was wore out after three and a half weeks. I don't even know how some of them do it. So love each other, but love those who you come in contact with with this week. Share God's love. That's God's mission. And you don't go in your own power. It is the power of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, if you have any questions about salvation or you have any questions about what was said, maybe you're thinking, I don't know how this is going to happen. My prayer is that if you need Jesus this morning, if if you're wondering who this Jesus is, My prayer is that you come and join me here. I'll talk with you. I'll pray with you. I'm sure there will be a couple other people that come up from your church if you're more comfortable with them. But if there's somebody here right now that doesn't have that relationship, that hasn't gone through the transformation that only Jesus can do, this is your time during this invitation. Maybe some of you are being called to mission work. Maybe some of you are being called to evangelism. Come and let somebody know so we can pray alongside you. I love listening to stories of people that walked down the aisle and said, I'm called to go to the mission field. And two weeks later, they're in the mission field. If that's you this morning, let us know. If something happened here during the prayer, during the commissioning of prayer, let us know. This is your time with the Lord. I don't even care if you stand. He might, but I don't care. Okay, this is your time with the Lord. If you need to sit there and just bow your head and become right with God, do that this morning. If you wanna stand up and worship the Lord, I don't even know what song we're singing, but if you wanna just worship the Lord, worship the Lord. But in whatever we do, I pray that you don't leave here the same as you came in. I pray you are strengthened. There's a transformation that happens. I pray that you are on fire for the Lord when you walk out those doors because the world is going to come at you fast. May you be blessed, I pray. Thank you for having me this morning. I just want to close this real quick and then I'll turn it over to you guys. Let's close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the message. We thank you for your love towards us. Lord, we thank you for transformed lives. We thank you for your mission that you've given us. But more than that, Lord, I pray that you are glorified in all that we do this week. May your name be glorified. May your aunt, may may just your, Lord, I pray that your face shines upon us, each of us this week. That when somebody looks at us, they know that that they've been with the Lord, that we've been with the Lord this morning. Guide us, direct us, I pray. We pray these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen.